I'm saying hello to everyone in class. Feel free to interact uh, freely without looking at me. I will be leaving the room. Okay. All right. So um, this is going to be a little bit more of an interactive class period, hopefully. A lot of uh, back and forth and um, me answering some questions, but also providing some of the um, initial groundwork for, um, well, one, calculating uh, absorption spectra in BASP. Um, and then secondly, uh, we'll go through and discuss um, how the electronic structure optimization fits into uh, geometric structure optimization, which you guys have um, already covered. So does that sound good with everyone? Got a thumbs up from Brendan? Okay. So from the slides Dr. Kilman sent me, it looks like you guys um, were discussing the Conchon algorithm in the last class period um, and looking at how uh, the electron density correlates to the total energy um, of some given uh, molecular system. And from where that fits in, you guys are on 21 out of 30, so getting close to being finished. Yay for that. And um, you guys are also doing presentations in a couple lectures. Yeah, you are? Okay. There was a, there was a centralized email to everyone um, with names telling who presents what. Please send me an email if you do not have idea what you are presenting. So, yeah, I guess keep that in mind for a couple of weeks. And if you guys have questions on any of the topics um, that you're presenting on, we can talk about that towards the end of class uh, today as well. So just feel free to ask um, either today or just shoot me an email if you have questions. Um, okay. Well, then, I guess the first thing uh, that we'll jump into is calculation of um, absorption spectrum of a given system. And so uh, to begin with where the spectrum comes from, I'm um, going to take a look at, at what parts are all involved in calculating um, an absorption coefficient. So here uh, we're looking mainly um, at this DIJ, the transition dipole element, uh, for a given transition between two specified electronic orbitals. And so you guys had um, looked at um, the generation of electron, uh, the Conchon orbitals um, in terms of total energy. Um, but one of the important things to keep in, or take into consideration about dipoles is the basic idea they can absorb a photon coming in and um, allow for this electronic transition to happen from an occupied orbital to an unoccupied orbital. So, um, given that if um, the transition dipole uh, is not equal to zero, there's some probability of a transition occurring uh, between those two electronic states. Um, but the second condition uh, needed for this is also that the energy difference between the two electronic states must be more or less equivalent to uh, the energy of the photon, this h nu. Uh, that's going to be hitting the material. And so, um, oh, I got to click up here. Okay. And so, um, the first thing, once you uh, finish some type of optimization calculation in VASP, um, is to build what we call um, a file that's named OS strength. So, um, the oscillator strength itself. Um, if you look on the middle of the right-hand side of the slide, um, there's an FIJ OS uh, term. So that's the oscillator strength, um, and it's uh, uh, relative to the square of the transition dipole moment uh, for a set or for a given set of two electronic states, and then a number of constants that also go along with it. And so. This oscillator strength file um, that we're generating um, is going to have a number of different components listed in it. The first things 
Those be listed are uh, the initial orbital indice I. Uh, the second column will be the final orbital indice J. Um, and then it's, it's sorted by the third column, which will be oscillator strength. And so uh, the way that the, the script will uh, put this out is in terms of that oscillator strength so that the highest, uh, most probable transitions are listed first. And then you'll see the energy of transition or the orbital energy difference in the next column. And then followed by um, the uh, directional uh, axis coordinates of X, Y, and Z for the transition. Um, and so once we have this, this file generated, uh, it can then be plugged into uh, the equation, um, which is done by a spectrum script um, and produces the absorption spectrum. So that's, I mean, that's kind of a brief overview on where um, and, and why the absorption spectrum can be produced. Do you guys have any questions? on this so far, or just... Okay. I don't see any, anybody waving hands above their head, so I'm assuming uh, we'll, we'll keep going. Okay. So, what is it that we need in order to um, calculate the oscillator strengths? Um, for a given system. So, oh, sorry, my phone keeps buzzing. It's getting like, um, so we do some type of optimization um, of the system and uh, it produces some type of converged wave function. So we now have solved um, for the cone chomp orbital localization and the energies associated with each, each of those. And so um, generally in the outcome file that's generated um, down towards the bottom in the last iteration, there will be a listing of uh, the number of orbitals, their corresponding energies, and then um, the populations of each one of those orbitals. And so um, when we, what we can try to do is, is we take that specific set of data, specific set of data of uh, orbital numbers, energies, and populations, and we put that into um, this file that we call states. So on the screen, um, kind of, let's see, uh, one, two, three, maybe four lines down in the middle, there's, there's a set of commands that say CP uh, states energy pop. And so that states file is the one that contains the information of, of what I just mentioned. Um, and so uh, we take that states file, which if you guys have done density of states, um, then that's the file you use to generate that. But you copy it into a file named energy pop. And then um, the other file that you're going to need is this input overlap. And uh, it's just a new file that you create using whatever your favorite um, editing command is, IUDI. Um, and you open up a new file, and it contains three lines. There's the, the first line will be the first orbital within the uh, orbital range that you're interested in. The second orbital will be the final uh, state that you're interested in. And then um, the last... The third line just contains the number one. Um, and it's actually not used in calculating the absorption spectra, um, but the input overlap file is used later um, if you start moving towards coupling uh, calculations, and then it's just uh, it's a necessary uh, value. So the, the main two input files are this energy pop and the input overlap, um, providing the states and their energies and the populations, and then just another another um, uh, another file just indicating which which uh, orbital numbers to look at. Now, one thing I found in doing this is um, you generally don't need 
Um, I mean, we generally don't need all of the, the states within a given system um, because when you're working with uh, systems that have thousands of electronic states, that's way too much and it's going to take forever. Um, ideally, we keep it less than 300 states. I mean, if you're using a small system, you know, it only has a couple hundred, um, not a big deal. Then you just go one through, say, if there's 200, 200. Um, otherwise, you kind of break it up into uh, regions of where the transitions might be of most interest. So anything, you know, maybe 3 v below uh, the HOMO and then go 3 v above the LUMO, uh, that type of transition range um, is generally what, what we're most interested in in semiconductor uh, research. And so um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, the whole preparing orbitals for the HOMO 32. Um, there will be a series of questions um, when you use, well, I'll, let me take a step back. So once you have those two input files uh, created, um, there's a code that he has shown here, this pathway bin OS, OS dipole version 3. Um, so you can execute that and um, it should uh, sit and spin for a little bit. Oh, never mind. I'm just going to go to the next slide. This will, there we go. This one's a little bit more easier to spin on. It's a little bit easier to understand. Um, okay. So this OS dipole script, um, and the end goal of this is to have it generate uh, the OS strength file. And so um, you'll see. Uh, a few lines pop on, up onto the screen after you execute, and it might sit and work for a while, um, and eventually, um, um, eventually we'll come up and say, uh, mission complete, um, OS, uh, uh, OS strength file created. Um, so where am I at on here? And so then uh, we're interested in you know trying to look at which which uh, states are involved. Is this somewhat interesting or not really? Unnecessary. I I can't hear you. I okay, I still can't hear you. Um I you guys kinda cut it out. Okay. So um, 
right, so we'll just, well, I've been questions on uh, OS strength file generation. No? Okay. Fair enough. So, um, also, how long does this class go? Goes until 105? Two? It goes until two. 150? Are you sending me an email? Okay. Um, So once we have this uh, ranking of oscillator strength files for all possible uh, transitions across the band gap, um, the next thing we want to do is we actually want to convert that into um, a file with, uh, with the absorption spectrum information. So uh, there's another code located in the bin called spectrum underscore imp, and then there's a value. Um, I think. Uh, I mean, here he has imp1. I mean, there are, there are a couple different versions of it in the bin. Um, so you can use whatever works for you. Uh, there are some variations for uh, generating spin polarized calculations um, and whatnot. Uh, but you can find one that works for you. Um, and so uh, after you prompt that command to run the script, there are going to be a number of um, values that the, the script asks you for. So the first one it's going to ask for is how many transitions do you have? And that's basically the length of the OS strength file. And so it'll give you that prompt of if you just do word count OS strength or WCS strength, it'll give you the line numbers. Uh, put that in. And then second thing it's going to ask for is what's the energy range that you're interested in? So um, are you interested in transition energies from you know, say maybe, say maybe two or four electron volts or, you know, a, a wide range of 0.5 to maybe 7. Um, so we give those two uh, inputs in sequential um, uh, answers. And then it's also going to ask for uh, some type of broadening. Um, and the width of each line we generally put in uh, is 0 0.01 electron volts. And then it's also going to ask for what is the homo in the system. And then uh, you can pull that from uh, one of your other files. Um, and then uh, it should execute and write out this file called spectrum. And so once you have that, um, I, it gives you a list of the um, energies in the system that it's sampled followed by the second column of what is the total absorption for that given energy. So depending on what energy, uh, transition energy range you give, um, it's going to dictate uh, how big the file is going to be. OK. And so now the slides are different than what you sent me the other day. Um, OK, so now. This is basically just screenshots of everything we just went through um, in generating the transition dipole. Um, the command is there, the bin OS dipole version 3. Um, and then um, by running the uh, spectrum file, or uh, spectrum code, and answering the questions, you produce um, more or less like vertical line um, uh, absorption values, uh, but then that are broadened um, into an absorption spectra. And let's see. I think these two slides are identical. Yes, they are. Oh, never mind. I just have two on here. So, anyways, so the resulting um, spectrum file can be converted into a usable image either in Excel or, um, I mean, we have scripts in Uplot 
uh, to do all this, or you can export it into your favorite um, data imaging software. It doesn't really matter. Um, once you guys, have you guys done any dynamics yet, or is that coming up? Not yet? Okay. So then I'm, I think that's probably one of the next few things. But once you get into uh, looking at dynamics, uh, you can actually start doing uh, like time-dependent absorption stuff uh, with um, the atomic coordinates of each time step and then just find the absorption spectra at each of those. So the images generated on the screen are using the plot uh, software and I mean we can modify um, these quite a bit, um, but that's, that's generally what we use. Okay, are there any questions on generation of absorption spectrum? Or we just want to get done with class relatively soon, go to lunch early? Okay. All right, so does this look familiar from your last lecture? More or less looking at the um, uh, Konsham theorem. Okay, so when, uh, I'll go to the screen, it's clear. Um, right, so when, when we're considering the atomic positions of uh, these nuclei um, and how they're arranged. Each one of them comes with uh, a different number of electrons and initial electronic structure given its location on the periodic table. And so um, this can also be affected by, uh, you know, interatomic distances between different types of atoms forming bonds um, and that type of thing. So you're going to get this uh, density distribution of the electrons, which then uh, is used in the total energy of the system. And so I'm not going to necessarily rehash all of this, but um, this idea that um, yeah. we, we can take um, we can take the locations of the electrons and use it in um, an easier method to try and calculate the total energy is something that's very valuable. So um, one of the ways that Dr. Killen, um, at least this is this is what I learned from him when um, I took a computational course, is he used lots of flow charts. And so um, given here are a way that he has his flow charts outlined. I'm not going to sit and, and go through that. But if you guys are curious later on looking at it, um, uh, you can have that. OK. So. We guys looked at the Kuhn-Chan algorithm last time, um, and now how does it fit into uh, something that you guys looked at in, I don't know, it's probably been within the first month or two of uh, geometry optimization. So this idea that um, electronic structure uh, is, is primarily based on, on three things. So in the input box up top, uh, the very top left one, we have Ri, which is, oh, this one's clear. All right, we have the positions of ions initially. So, uh, and you can do this at any given time step, but we're looking at frozen geometric coordinates of uh, atomic nuclei, um, and then the total number of electrons in the given system. And then the third thing we need is this convergence limit. So, how long are we going to run this? Um, this algorithm? Are we just going to let it spin into eternity? Or is there some, something that we say, okay, this is reasonable, um, it, it's good enough for now? So, using those three criteria, um, given the position of the ions and the number of electrons, some initial density is kind of guessed. And so, that's the, when it says density, though, it's just an initial guess of the density. Uh, because we don't always know the exact geometry or optimal geometry for a given system. We're just kind of guessing relative positions. And so um, with this initial density, um, it can be put into uh, this Kuhn-Chan algorithm that you guys went through, right? So we look at the potential and how the total energy, which is dependent on density, changes um, 
with respect to density itself. And these are the potential Sorry. So the potentials um, are used in the one electron uh, equations or the eigenvalue equations are uh, shown in the second box. So looking at the kinetic and potential portions acting on some um, Kohn-Sharp orbital produces its energy. And the total overall density um, is a summation of the wave function probabilities for all states. Sorry, this is getting really annoying. I haven't had this many phone calls in the span of like five minutes, probably like four weeks. Um, okay, so we're looking at the um, total density as a summation of all uh, electron probability, right? So the summation of each individual Kohn-Sharp orbital. Um, and so when we're looking at what he has labeled here, theta i, um, this initial probability is, is what's going to correlate to uh, some type of partial charge density, right? You think of probability as just the square of the wave function. And so through this cycle, um, we get to some type of criteria where from our initial guess of the density, we've produced an energy, um, but now through this iteration, um, we look at uh, a new energy that gets calculated. And if the difference, and the absolute value of the difference between the old and the new uh, the two time steps is below some given tolerance level, um, we can move on to the next step. Um, and it produces the output of saying, here, this is, this is what we were looking for. Um, we've reached um, in, uh, the minimal energy given by the parameters. Now, if that's not the case, um, What's going to happen is we're going to get a shift in um, the ionic coordinates, and then the density will shift accordingly, and then it'll go back through that same cycle in calculating uh, the total energy on the new relocalized density. And so um, it's, uh, it'll sit and spin in the box um, depending on uh, what the input values are um, for the calculation. And the end goal is just to get an optimization of uh, this electronic structure. Um, We will get through this.
Seriously? That's what I cut. This one. I'm gonna stop here. Okay. Um. <laughs> shoot. Okay. Um. Well, I I don't know where to stop. Where like, do you guys have any? Do you have any initial questions on on what this means or how this gets implemented in the past? You have no questions. Do you understand what it means? Kind of. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I guess if you're ever going to look into the outcar file, um, you're going to, or even if you open up the Ozicar file, you're going to see that there's a number of iterations. Um, and then printouts of total energy uh, at some given time step. And so different um, different steps require a different number of calculation steps in between them, given how far off of the convergence criteria they are, um, or how, how far off the, um, the geometry might be. So we could have, um, If we did like a one-step self-convergence uh, calculation, like an SCF, um, you know that that might take 20, 30 steps, or it might take six or seven uh, recalculations of uh, the electronic structure itself uh, without um, without changing the, the the positions of the nuclei. Um, but one, if we do some type of geometry optimization, you'll see an initial energy. It might run for 10, 15 steps. You see an energy. It might run, uh, you know, it might be another eight, nine lines before the second iteration, and so on. And um, you do this electronic calculation, trying to converge the energy. Um, and once you hit your limit, okay, you move to. Um, well, I guess you guess what this flow chart is showing. Um, so here, where he has um, this new equals U R uh, circled kind of down on the um, down on the bottom. Right. So this whole this whole idea of what, what's the potential looking at the energy of the system. So instead of just doing this basic uh, concept of saying, hey, something happens here, um, now you can plug in this Conchon algorithm into the geometry optimization algorithm. Um, so you go from some energy, um, it's gonna the positions are gonna change dependent on what the potential is, um, and then you get a calculation of new atomic coordinates, and those new atomic coordinates will jump back into uh, this algorithm. You'll solve for an electronic structure, and when that's done, it'll go back into here and um, continue in this cycle until either you've reached the maximum number of steps you provided in the INCA file or. Um, We've reached the convergence for uh, for the calculation, and so um, the whole the whole goal of doing this type of electronic structure calculation is to get to get the best energy um, possible, the most accurate energy possible, um, and also in the same way for geometry optimization, um, applying a little bit excuse me a little bit more intense electronic structure calculation to guide uh, the directionality of the atomic coordinates um, along the potential. And so uh, when we can get um, some type of uh, optimized geometry, we might uh, be able to find that um, now we're in a good spot to start analyzing the ground state uh, electronic structure of the system and, and take the results like the density states and the absorption spectra uh, as valid information from that system. And so this, uh, this is more or less the same thing of uh, the jam trap optimization uh, algorithm with this black box of not knowing what it is. We put uh, DFT in there and calculate the electronic structure um, to get out um, the optimized uh, electronic structure and uh, geom geometric structure. And so, um, I guess these next few slides kind of just reiterate that in a little bit larger fashion, where you take this potential at the next time step, you 
equal to potential with uh, g coordinates. And then now we have a DFT uh, algorithm in there, um, like we had. So that's kind of, um, I mean, that, that's more or less what, what um, the implementation of DMT, DFT into a geometry optimization looks like. Um, so there's, there's more or less two things where one is um, the overall goal is to refine the geometric structure of the system. Um, but in doing so, you need to um, try, you need to optimize the electronic structure at each one of those um, coordinate positions to try and guide the coordinates to the, uh, to the lowest energy, to try and find the bottom of that potential. And so at this point, um, do you guys have questions on um, any of this? Or uh, are you guys running into problems and trying to calculate certain things in BASP? Or just do you have general life questions that maybe I can answer? We can have a fireside chat with John. So your email, sorry, I just saw your email, was asking about if the dipole reads the wave car. Yes. Um, are there any other questions? Oh, I guess there's one more slide. Um, so, Would you agree that you, this is what you achieved today? Did you achieve an understanding of how this code works, an ability to operate the codes efficiently, or understanding possible errors that may arise? Yeah? Okay. Anyways, so, I mean, <laughs> well, if you guys understand, this is great. It took me it took me longer than one class period to get this all figured out, um, but uh, now that um, you have an ability to uh, calculate an optimized uh, structure, um, the next thing you guys are going to start to do is to start running heating calculations and molecular dynamics, um, and the ability to um, understand how forces uh, are interacting between uh, different ions, different atoms, um, allows for uh, the study of, of things like uh, that I do, magnetic dynamics or uh, chemical reaction types of just looking at uh, different ways that the atoms are interacting. Um, and so depending on uh, what type of functional you use within DFT calculation, um, we'll give you uh, different results just based on um, if it's a pure functional or a hybrid, uh, I'm sorry, what percentage of hybrid FOC uh, is used, um, but also uh, the different uh, exchange correlation uh, pieces that are used between different functionals. Um, and I guess I, you guys are going to have, uh, oh, maybe that was when I took the course. Um, I don't know if you guys are going to have an actual developer of functionals uh, talk or not. Um, but uh, that can also be uh, fairly interesting. And so, um, yeah, I, that's more or less what I got. And I'm happy to sit and answer questions for you guys. Otherwise, you guys are going to do what you want. Live your life.
Alright, see you guys. Have a good rest of your day. Oh, and Aaron, I'll send you an email uh, later this afternoon. I already know. Alright.